I'd like to start with a disclaimer that definitely for pulmonary chronic pulmonary embolism, the treatment of choice is definitely surgery and the role of a catheter-based inter intervention is for those uh, who are considered inoperable. So again, what are the indications for endovascular treatment and other forms of treatment, particularly balloon pulmonary angioplasty? First, considered as inoperable CTEF because of advanced age or comorbid conditions, mind you, this decision has to be taken by an, a team that is experienced in interpreting CTEF cases and should include the CTEF surgeon who should be part of the panel to decide that this is indeed an inoperable case and requires balloon procedure. Also, if the lesions are per predominantly peripheral and not really central, they qualify for balloon pulmonary angioplasty. If there is peripheral pulmonary stenosis and if there is recurrence or persistence of CTEF after surgery, wherein doing a second time surgery is indeed a big, big risk. This is the echo which shows right atrium and right ventricular dilatation and you will also see dilated pulmonary arteries. Often we find clots in the pulmonary vasculature. This is the CT pulmonary angiogram which we do routinely and this is the benchmark or the gold standard to decide which modality of treatment should be taken. Here, if you, if you notice, predominantly there is peripheral pulmonary artery disease and this does not qualify for surgery and as a team we decide that this patient requires balloon pulmonary angioplasty. A pulmonary angiogram is often done. The purpose of doing this is again, again to have a better idea of anatomy. You can use multiple views, particularly to delineate which are the branches that you would like to target by an interventional procedure. We would also like to complete a coronary angiogram because since it is an open chest procedure, if the patient so requires a revascularization, it can be combined at the same time. Mapping of collaterals is not really necessary because once you accomplish a fair task, these collaterals will automatically disappear. This is the flow chart how you treat patients with CTEF and you can see clearly here that CTEF is the treatment of choice and for those who, do, who are considered inoperable, we look at balloon pulmonary angioplasty. This forms an interim between uh, CTEF surgery and lung transplantation. I represent the center which does the maximum uh, surgical cases. Uh, Narayan Tadelia is known to perform one of the maximum cases the world over. To date, we have 423 cases of surgery and automatically those who do not qualify come into our domain for a balloon procedure. We boast of one of the success rates that is comparable to the best centers in the world. So here are the options for inoperable CTEF, which is basically the crux of my talk, balloon pulmonary angioplasty. If you see the ESC guidelines, it's class 2B level of evidence C, which is the same as surgery. Atrial septostomy is an option. Transcatheter, POTS anastomosis, shunt creation, and pulmonary artery denervation completes the basket of options available for such patients. So basically, what do we do in balloon pulmonary angioplasty? The purpose is to ensure vessel patency and of course to break webs. All of you would be aware that as clots get organized, they produce webs and this forms the obstruction and no amount of anticoagulation can, can help to dissolve this, so an interventional procedure is required. The surgeon finds the plane and is able to scoop out the webs with forceps, but we will have to accomplish this with a balloon. Multiple angiographies in various views, here we would prefer a biplane um, uh, cat lab if it is available at your center and selective angiographies are done in multiple views. We use the angiogram reports as well as the CT reports, sit with the interventional radiologist as well as the surgeon to decide which are the bronchopulmonary uh, segments that we would like to target. Here you see obstruction, narrowing, punching defects and webs. We also combine with an OCT or an IVUS where necessary for better vessel anatomy. We use a right femoral vein axis, a jugular axis is also okay, but the problem is you need to introduce an 8 French sheet. So a femoral vein axis is probably better. We use a JR catheter, 8 French again. You can use longer sheets that are currently available, but we found that the JR sheet in our experience gives better accessibility to the various bronchopulmonary segments. The concept is pretty simple. An 014 inch floppy guide wire is introduced and then you reach and cross the lesion, cross the web and then you serially dilate with a 220, 320, 420 and 520 as the vessel size may be dep depending on the CT picture as well as the angiogram and maybe if, if you have data of the IVUS. 
A greater dilatation is done starting with 2 millimeters, 2, two atmospheres distally and bring it up to 4, 6 and 8 as we reach the proximal part of the vessel. Target just 5 to 6 branches in one lung zone. Remember that doing too many can cause reperfusion pulmonary edema. Use IVAS as and when necessary. Here I'd like to add that there are two innovations that are currently available. We can, we can use a flow wire which can tell us the pressure across the lesion as also a Pepsi score which is the pulmonary edema predictive scoring index which helps us to decide which are the patients who are likely to develop pulmonary edema or reperfusion edema post procedure. The strategy can often be decided based on a combination of your CT report, your angiogram report, your IVAS and OCT report. Here again there is a beautiful classification that has been given by Fukuda et al which was published and here again you have five types of lesions. Suffice to say that you can strategize, you need to break the webs, but if you have a pouch defect with complete occlusion, stay away from these lesions because these are likely to rupture ending in a massive hemoptysis, emergency and even death of the patient. The hardware, I have flashed it all here for you, the long femoral sheet, a guiding sheet, the guide wires, as I mentioned we use an 014 floppy wire. We can also use a B palm wire, which is the designate wire for balloon pulmonary angioplasty. However, not approved for use by DCGI, and you'd like you would have to take prior permission for using this wire since it's not yet approved for use in the country. The specific designate balloon for balloon pulmonary angioplasty is the cross pander balloon. The the, the technicality of this balloon is a uniform expansion and the chance of a rupture of the pulmonary arteries in the distal pulmonary tree is limited. Here again you have graded sizes as I have shown in the compliance chart. Last image that I have shown in the bottom is Cerescu. This is gelatin sponge particles. This is a lifesaver for both the patient as well as the operator because if you have a torrential hemorrhage, unless you are able to plug that, the patient bleeds massive amounts in short intervals of time leading to collapse and even death of the patient. Even if you have a surgeon that's available in the center, getting to that particular bronchopulmonary segment and sealing the, the area of bleed can be quite an uphill task and it requires a lot of experience and real speed to save that particular patient. Here again, uh, this flashes the uh, complications of the procedure. You can have reperfusion edema, hemoptysis, dissection, a rupture of the vessels, guide wire perforation and parenchymal and pleural bleeds. I must emphasize here as I have always said, you must have surgical backup ready at the center where you are doing this procedure. Now this is the, a few shots of the angiogram. You can see that in the upper segment, I have shown a 220 followed by a 320 balloon dilatation of the upper segment and you can see that the final result shows an excellent patency of the vessel. The next one shows a, a complete occlusion in the upper panel. We managed to cross the particular lesion um, and with a floppy wire and then uh, we also used a micro catheter support and following this we used a coronary balloon for support to get the wire anchored in the distal tree and then you, 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 we used graded balloons of 220, 320 and 420 to dilate the lesion. You can see that the mid segment is completely recreated. This patient was very, very symptomatic with the ability to walk less than 50 meters and today he boasts of no limitation, class 2 NYHA, his oxygen saturation is perfectly normal at room temperature. This is the snapshot of the procedures that we've done till now, 15 patients, 49 lesions, we've had excellent results. And this is also a glimpse of the complications that we ran into. Four patients had reperfusion edema, minimal hemoptysis in two of them. Fortunately, none of them required surgery. And also one patient who had a bailout procedure. In fact, we started this procedure as a bailout for surgically unsuccessful cases. We lost one of them on the 24th day. So the mortality is one out of the many cases that we've done so far. In all this journey, the lessons that I've learned are summarized in three lines. Never exceed six branches because the possibility of pulmonary edema is huge. Never aim for a perfect result. You're not looking at a coronary angioplasty result or a certificate. You just want patency of the vessel. Warning signs if the patient coughs on table, that's your indication to stop the procedure. This is a review of literature. Lots of centers have done wonderful work and we've also joined the bandwagon. 
some other quick, quick takes on what are the other procedures that we can do endovascular. This is an intraatrial septostomy. We started off with a balloon dilatation and then this is currently the device. It is called as a Corvia interatrial septal defect device that is available and this animation shows how to deploy it. You use a broken burrow needle, a stiff wire to cross the intraatrial septum and deploy this, uh, uh, deploy the intraatrial septal device. A beautiful device if you want a bailout in a patient who is very sick with high right atrial pressures. And this is how it looks and this is the first case that we did alongside pulmonary artery denervation, losing its ground similar uh, to the renal simplicity uh, trial. Denervation was attempted in our center. We had fairly successful results but we don't know the long term results in such patients. And lastly, this is for those that separates the boys from the men, the percutaneous pot shunt. It is in those centers which don't have a surgeon but you still want to do your bit to save your patient's life. You do a percutaneous iotopulmary shunt with a modified broken burrow needle and use a stiff wire to get through from the descending iota into the left pulmonary artery and then dilate it with a balloon and use a covered stent. Indeed, heroic stuff but has been done. You have publications to this effect. You use an I-cast covered balloon, uh, I-cast co covered stent to uh, say, uh, to uh, seal whatever rent you have created. High risk procedure can be fatal. You should do your groundwork and legalities before you venture into this. To conclude, guideline directed management is the best option for your patient. NOACs offer an alternative to warfarin. Endotrectomy, surgical is the treatment of choice for CTEF. But for those who are inoperable, we now offer hope by interventional procedures. And there is absolute hope for the hopeless. Even if the patient is inoperable, we are there for them. This is the team from Japan, Dr. Yamashita et al, who visited us and made our first procedure possible. Thanks everybody.